Uh, thank you, Chairman. Uh, witnesses, thank you so much for your time. A, a couple things I want to get to. Uh, Mr. McCool, quick for you first. Um, in May 23 of this year, FEMA published a document titled Questions and Answers about Travel Trailer Removal on Barrier Islands. Specifically, the document says that the August 1 target date for removing trailers should allow many homeowners to complete their repairs and return to their homes. Can you please provide an update on whether FEMA has repossessed any trailers uh, allocated to uh, my constituents in Barrier Islands? Yes, sir. Thank you for the question. <clears throat> As you know, Pine Island, Sanibel, and Fort Myers Beach were catastrophic. Mm -hmm. We end, At the end state, we ended up putting 111 travel trailers on those three islands. There's 16 there left now. Those folks that have moved out have either moved into another FEMA facility, like a direct lease, an apartment, or their home has been repaired. So, and there's 16 households that have elected to stay, and they know the risk that that they're under. Okay, but again, let, me, let me follow up to that question uh, because there were two issues surrounding travel trailers. The first was the initial deployment, which in my view took forever and a day, considering the fact that we had, inst we had people who were instantly displaced. The second concern was there was a concern with FEMA around uh, FEMA's reg regulation about putting travel trailers in a flood zone, but Southwest Florida, we're in a flood zone for the most part. Um, so can you speak specifically to the initial delay and to the regulatory issues surrounding FEMA's position around travel trailers in a flood zone, considering the fact that the disaster area is in a flood zone? There's a myriad of regulations and policies that we work through. The bottom line is, if there is no practicable solution, we were allowed to put, after intense coordination with the local building official, floodplain manager in each community, travel trailers are manufactured housing units in a special flood hazard area. So of the 1,335 units that are in, uh, 933 are in a special flood hazard area. And, and 11, 111 are, are, were placed out on the three islands, and, and like I said, 16 remain now. We did, um, the good news is, nine, every person Every household has a housing solution. We will complete the housing mission at the end of this month. All right, specific to that though, can you speak to the, the, the timetable between a uh, request for housing assistance from, from a residence in a special flood area to the time when FEMA actually made the determination that they could place trailers in the special flood area? Like, well, how much time are we talking about? It was about 45 days. Okay. Is there, what are the regulatory concerns surrounding FEMA taking four to five days? Not even so much the regulatory concerns. What are the procedural concerns around it taking FEMA 45 days to make such a declaration? Like internally, is there an issue around process time, approval stage? Um, is it highly bureaucratic? Do you have to get authorization from the Director of Homeland Security? Is this an internal FEMA matter? Like, walk me through that. Why does it take 45 days? Because understand from my vantage point, I got residents who were out of a house. The first couple of days, they're trying to figure out what's going on. Then they make a request, and then they're waiting 45 to 60 days, and I will add, Mr. McCool, sometimes longer than that. Mm -hmm. So walk me through the internal process of FEMA, and what will be your recommendations on how to repair that for the future? Well, you know, because you've been in them, and I saw you in many of the shelters. From the shelters, we had transitional shelter assistance. Think of hotels in three states, and we had thousands of households uh, in, those, in those transitional shelter assistance waiting for um, a temporary housing solution, whether it be a travel trailer, mobile home, direct lease, or a multifamily repair. Um, we worked through, in 45 days, the regulatory and, and policy requirements. Uh, and and I, I don't think we could have worked any faster. Um, and the bottom line is we have to keep people safe. We don't want to put people at risk. And so we did, we did a very um, deliberate flood risk analysis, both for the three islands and every county that uh, was affected. And we had a direct housing mission for. Uh, and, that, and that took about 45 days. So I'm, I'm confident that that the units that are placed are, are, are safely placed uh, in a special flood hazard area, which we don't usually do. 
This is a, this is a unique uh, situation. Okay, but I'm, I'm going to follow up to that follow-up. I'm confused because FEMA already draws basically the flood maps for the United States. So FEMA, FEMA already has an understanding of what are your baseline flood zones, your high-risk flood zones, et cetera. So that, that data already exists. So let me ask it this way. What would you say, what would you recommend to, to Congress to essentially alleviate or to make it far more streamlined the, the regulatory burden you're under for making these disaster decisions? Because the, the number one thing we want to make sure occurs is that the Federal Emergency Management Agency mm -hmm. can be depth and flexible enough to respond to emergencies in real time, not go through regulatory checks while people are struggling in real life. So what would you recommend to us in terms of what are the regulatory or statutory changes FEMA might need so that we don't have to go through, uh, for lack of a better phrase, a bureaucratic work workflow like this in the future? The regulatory requirements that we have now I think are effective to keep people safe and we put units safely in a, in a, in a floodway. Yeah, but or, Mr. McCool, yeah. you're, so let me paint this picture for you. It is now... October 24th, mm -hmm. you're a month displaced, 28 days. You're in a shelter. You're not quite sure what is going on. It is still hot here in Southwest Florida. How are you safe? Or better yet, let's say you're not in a shelter. What if you're somebody who's still living in their structure because they choose not to go to a shelter because they don't want to leave their property behind? How are they more safe living in their in their house that is damaged by storm while FEMA is going through a process to, to establish if whether a travel trailer can sit in their driveway on Fort Myers Beach, where if you just walk down the street of Fort Myers Beach, although there was a ton of debris all over the place, as long as you clear the pad, the trailer can sit there. Like, walk me. I'm sure, that's what I'm trying to understand. And as I ask that question, I'm saying that not from, you know, with all due respect to my staff, not a, a list of questions my staff has. That's talking with people who were on the ground day one, day 10, day 25, trying to figure out where, where is the housing mission with respect to FEMA? We're now in August. So, okay, the housing mission, to your words, are about to be finished, but the storm was 10 months ago. Sir. So that, that's, that's what I'm trying to ascertain. I don't know if you can help me with that. Every case is different. Um, we talk to each survivor 22 times before they go into a household. Access and functional needs, family composition, the placement of the unit on your private site, or getting a commercial park, removing the debris, identifying a group site, all that takes time. Okay. Let me ask you this. What are some examples of unintended consequences that FEMA has experienced based on specific United States code provisions passed by Congress over the years? You, you've been doing this a long time. I'm quite sure internally you guys are like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe they passed this back in 92. This was stupid. Or I can't believe they did this post-Katrina. I got what they were trying to do, but it's not really helpful. Uh, what are you guys internally saying about some of the stuff that's in the United States Code that we can adjust? I'd like to get back to you on the record with the specifics of that, Congressman. On, on the record or off the record? On the record. Oh, okay, yeah. that's good. Um, Mr. Chairman, I don't know if other members have questions. I got other questions, but I want to make sure I let the members have time yes, if they, what they so, want. Well, let's, let's come to some agreement here that you have agreed that you will provide this committee and the gentleman, Mr. Donalds, that information that you do not have readily available right now. When would the gentleman be providing that? We'll work quickly with our staff at, at headquarters. And, and our goal is two weeks. The gentleman has suggested that it would be two weeks. So I would agree to me. that. What would the gentleman, from Mr. Donald, say? Uh, that's, that's fine by me. We I would agree with that. Mr. McCool, thank you very much. A professional response uh, we expect and want to thank you very much. As we had stated from the beginning, the outcome, we wanted decision makers who were here. That does not mean you understand every single circumstance, and we respect and appreciate that. 